Now let's get into the Word of God. So uh, if you'd like to turn to Acts chapter 8, please. Acts chapter 8, and we'll read from verse 1 right through to verse 8. Acts chapter 1, and we are continuing on with our series through the book of Acts. And the Word of God says, I'm going to start just into Acts chapter 1. Sorry, Acts chapter 8, verse 1, and it says, And there arose on that day a great persecution against the church in Jerusalem. And they were all scattered throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria, except the apostles. Devout men buried Stephen and made great lamentations over him. But Saul was ravaging the church, and entering house after house, he dragged off men and women and committed them to prison. Now those who were scattered went about preaching the word. Philip went down to the city of Samaria and proclaimed to them the Christ. And the crowds with one accord paid attention to what was being said by Philip. When they heard him and saw the signs that he did, for unclean spirits crying out with a loud voice came out of many who had them, and many who were paralyzed or lame lame were healed. So there was much joy in that city. Let us commit our time to the Lord in prayer. Lord, our mighty God, uh, the one who has granted the gift of this day, uh, the one who has granted the gift of your dear son uh, to leave the realms of glory and to come into sinful humanity, but not to sin himself, Lord, but to be a pure vessel, uh, to be that pure sacrifice, sacrifice for sin, to die on our behalf and to rise again, that we might have life in him, to bring us to the Father, eternal life now. Lord, what a wonderful privilege. What an eternal blessing. And Lord, thank you for making yourself known through the very word of God. And I pray that we would be like those at Samaria who gave attention to the word of God and then went away with great joy. Also, Lord, may you move in all of our hearts and minds as we consider this text of Scripture, as we consider what happened in the early church, and to turn our mind and hearts to our relationship with Christ, and to be found in Him, strengthened and used for His glory, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, one of the pastimes I really enjoy is actually gardening. And uh, one of the challenges I'm realizing is it's not easy to look after fruit trees. If you've ever had fruit trees, there's somewhat of an art to it. And I think I'm starting to work out that art. Um, Fruit trees, in order to fruit well, they need to be pruned. Uh, They need their limbs lopped off so that they can produce fruit. They need the dead branches gone. Now, if you get it right a lot of fruit will be produced. But if you start getting it wrong, there will not be much fruit. Like my plum tree last year, I think I over pruned it and that year there was simply no fruit whatsoever. Now, in this analogy, we have a sort of paradox. A paradox is something that seems self-contradictory but actually, actually becomes true. The paradox of the fruit in trees is that in order to help the plant do what it's meant to do, and that is fruit, isn't it? Fruit trees are made to fruit. Well, you've got to actually harm it in order to help it. You have to take off those things that are not necessary, and you have to take off those things that will actually help it produce fruit. Now, for the fruit tree, it might seem rather painful But you know, as the gardener, as the wise gardener, that by your secretaries, you are actually helping it take off or to actually produce fruit. So it requires a little bit of wisdom from the gardener. I need a little bit of wisdom. I look up on YouTube. uh, Or when to cut, how to cut, how much to cut off. And by my cutting, what's going to happen? Fruit is going to be produced. You know where I'm going with this, don't you? There is somewhat of an analogy regarding fruit in trees in Scripture. But it's not so much fruit in trees as it is fruit in believers. And that is found in John chapter 15. 
And Jesus represents this somewhat of a paradox. He says here in John chapter 15, verses 1 to 2, Jesus said, I am the true vine, and my father is the vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. And every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes that it may bear more fruit. See, this is the paradox of the Christian life. This is the paradox of the church life. The great sovereign vine dresser is interested in producing fruit in you, in the church. Good gospel, wholesome, pure, life giving, life sustaining, God glorifying fruit. But he has to do a work in order to produce it. He has to cut away certain things from your life and to bring certain things upon the church's life in order for that fruit to be born. How does he do it? Quite often, it's through the process of pruning through trials, through suffering, through difficulties, and through persecution. And it is this that I'm sure if you look at your life, you look back and you would say, It wasn't in the times when everything was peaceful and everything was comfortable that the Lord did his work. It was in those times when you look back and say, man, I was so close to the Lord when he was cutting me through the trials and the sufferings that I was going through. It is those times you look back and you say, Lord, thank you for that. And by that good gospel, pure fruit is being born through your life. Lamentations 3, 37 says, Who has spoken? Who has spoken and it came to pass? Unless the Lord has commanded it. Is it not from the mouth of the Most High that good and bad come? See, every Christian knows that ultimately all trials... All difficulties are under the sovereign hand of the great vine dresser. And who brings them? It is he that brings them to bear fruit for his glory and our good. And the great passion of our God is to reveal his glory to the ends of the earth through his people as we proclaim the gospel and as we are transformed by the gospel. This is his means and this is how he does it. And it is this analogy that comes into play in our text this morning in Acts chapter 8, verses 1 to 8. I want to give you a number of items, faith-strengthening ways the Lord fulfills his mission through his people, through the work of suffering, trials, difficulties, And the first is this. The first is, how does God fulfill his mission? By making persecution a servant and not a master. By making persecution a servant and not a master. Now, let's get some uh, definitions down pat first. What is persecution? Because sometimes we can get this wrong and, uh, and we can think we're being persecuted when we probably, well, we might not be. So let me give you two analogies or two stories, one's fictitious, the other is true. The first is the fictitious one. So there is a young guy who is so zealous for Christ, he wants to tell everyone about the Lord. And that's a good thing. And he's doing it at work, he's sharing with his um, you know, with co- co-workers, his, uh, his workmates, he's doing it during work hours. And so he's, and so he's spending so much time doing, uh, sharing the gospel that... He's not spending a heap of time doing his work. And his boss says, listen, would you stop pushing your religion upon uh, people during work hours? And so the young man reading scripture and thinks, man, I'm being persecuted for the faith here. And he keeps going. And he gets sacked. And he realizes that's part of bearing the cross. <laughs> you know? That's a fictitious one. I'm sure that's, a, that's true in many, many places. But then there's the real story. And this is a story of... One man, young man in um, Armenia who I met a number of years ago, and I can't remember whether I told you this, but 
Uh, in Armenia, it, it's a poor nation. And uh, to have a job is a blessing. It's a really good thing. And he had got, his, got a job in the army. So here he is in the army. And he was despairing of his life. Uh, and he walked into the Central Baptist Church in Yerevan. And he came in confrontation with Jesus. And he believed on the Lord Jesus Christ for his life and for his soul. And it transformed his life. And so then he would attend, when he's not working in the army, he would attend at night to the Baptist church. Well, the um, apostolic, Armenian apostolic army commander, because it's apostolic area, um, said, don't keep attending the Baptist church. uh, Or, you know, there'll be ramifications. Um, so he did not do it for some time, and he realized, no, I've got to attend no matter what the, what the cost. So he ends up going back, he attends the church, and builds up his strength in the Lord, and he was released from his responsibilities in the army. And then for six months, he was without a job, leaning upon the believers in the church. Two ways persecution can be perceived. Let's, let me give you two things that define persecution. We cannot claim to be persecuted anytime something harsh comes upon us or we are mistreated. It was not the first man's faith that caused persecution. It was his failure to work honestly for his boss. That's what happened. Persecution for the faith is when a believer experiences opposition due to their identity with and devotion to Christ, not cheating the boss. Secondly, persecution takes many forms. Matthew 5, 11 says, Blessed are you when others revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. Oh, persecution can take many forms. It can be just simply belittling you, uh, leaving you out uh, because you're different, because you make a stance. Or Or it could be taking you to prison or even end up killing you. I wanted to give that as a, an example to understand, could we be persecuted in, in where we are in our life? As we enter this text, a great persecution comes upon the church. Have a look. Verse 1, And there was arose on that day a great persecution against the church in Jerusalem. Up to this time, now we've been working through the text from the start of Acts 1, up to this time there has been relative peace upon the church. Oh, there's been persecution, but it, the scope and the intensity has not been that great. Uh, we've looked at this. We've seen that in Acts 4.21, we find there is a persecution given against John and Peter. They are told, verbally told, do not preach the gospel. And they went away and they continue to preach the gospel, as we ought to do. Then it intensifies in scope and intensity... It says in uh, Acts 5.60, all the apostles now are are arrested. So not just John and Peter, all of the apostles are are arrested and they are told the same thing. Do not preach the gospel and just to make sure they were flogged and then released. Start new intense here. And then we saw last week that it intense way more. In chapter 7, we saw that persecution now goes from the leadership to the actual congregants, to the people. When Stephen is taken, he is persecuted, he is actually killed for his faith. But now in our text, it's like we've just switched, uh, we've put the gas on or we've we've, uh, tripped a switch, where the persecution just goes rampant and wide. For it says that a great, on that day, a great persecution came against the church. There was only one church, and it's the church. It started with the, uh, the, the leaders, and now it's reached to the whole church where a persecution has been greatly intensified. And we get a picture of this here in verse 3. For it says, Saul was ravaging the church. And entering house after house, he dragged off men and women and committed them to prison. John Stott says, uh, calls it a brutal and sadistic cruelty. The word ravaging here, uh, the meaning has the idea of being basically 
uh, ripped apart by a beast, just ripped to shreds. This is how Saul is doing it. No longer was he content with simply squashing the preaching of the gospel as he was going to squash even those people who named Christ. All of them will go. And he's going from house to house. You've heard about this before, haven't you? It's like he is now the Jewish Gestapo, leaving no stone unturned, going with his people to, from house to house, dragging them off to prison and no doubt torturing them. Why was he doing this? Galatians 1.13, for you have heard, this is Paul speaking, Saul converted to Paul, you have heard of my former life in Judaism, how I persecuted the church of God violently and tried to destroy it. He was not content until he destroyed the church. In Jerusalem, it's contained, let's get it and let's annihilate it. And it was so intense, the word, again, uh, ravaging is in the imperfect tense, which means it's not complete. It is a continual ravaging. I will destroy until everything is done with. When Paul was speaking to King Agrippa, he goes back to tell King Agrippa, as he's trying to convert King Agrippa, what his previous life was like. Listen to this. I myself was convinced that I ought to do many things in imposing, opposing the name of Jesus of Nazareth. And I did so in Jerusalem. I not only locked up many of the saints in prison after receiving authority from the chief priests, but when they were put, when they were put to death... I cast my vote against them and I punished them often in all the synagogues and tried to make them blaspheme and in raging fury against them, I persecuted them even to foreign cities. This this persecution in Jerusalem is bad, real bad. Like this this is the persecution you would see in the Middle East right now. And Saul is heading it up and he would not spare any. And we know that our desire is not at all to be persecuted. Uh, That that would be sadistic to think that, uh, yes, I'm a Christian, I want to be persecuted. No, of course, none of us want to be persecuted. We ought not to want that. that. We are going to be collecting a Christmas offering, as Curtis mentioned, as we normally do every year for the persecuted church. And as Curtis said, you can put that through online. Because we want to help the persecuted church. And yet, don't miss this, the persecution did not come without the sovereign hand of God allowing it and using it. Persecution in God's hand is not a master, but a servant. How so? Let's have a look at a number of things. It displays the power of the gospel to save. I love what this sort of text is showing us here. What Luke is trying to show is, look who is persecuting. It is Saul. And then let's see what he becomes. And that will show you the power of the gospel. Christ's ability to save is more powerful than any sin that you have ever committed. Saul becomes poor because of the blood of Christ. And every murder... And every persecution against the church of Christ is washed away. Talk about the power of gospel to save. He reminds Timothy, 1 Timothy 1, 12 to 14. I thank him who has given me strength, Christ Jesus our Lord, because he judged me faithful, appointing me to his service, though formerly I was a blasphemer, persecutor, and insolent opponent, but I received mercy because I had acted ignorantly in unbelief, and the grace of our Lord overflowed for me with the faith and love that are in Christ Jesus. Such is the gospel that saves. He looks back on his life and says, that's what I was, but now this is what I am because of the purifying blood of Jesus. Just know this, everyone here, there is no sin too great for Christ to forgive you and to cleanse you from. No sin. That is the power of the gospel. How is is persecution a servant and not a master? It protects the church from getting comfortable. 
It protects the church from getting comfortable. We see in the first seven chapters of Acts, we see a, a strong church, a robust church, a united church, a church, Acts 2 42, they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, to the fellowship, to the breaking of bread, and to prayers. They are a quality church. They are looking after the needs of the people. They are praying. They are worshipping. They are eating together. They are singing. This is a blessed church. And then we see that this relative peace and prosperity, spiritual prosperity, soon goes because on that great day, on that day, a great persecution against the church in Jerusalem arose, scattering people throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria. What the church had come to terms with, and so do we, that there is a somewhat of a tension that we, that we live with as, as a church and as individuals. There is, on the one hand, that as this church in the first seven chapters of Acts, they need to grow in the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ. They are to dig deep into doctrine. They are to stand on the apostles' teaching. They are to meet the needs of others. This is the right thing of a church, a robust church, a strong church. They worship together, they pray together, they look after the needs of each other. They uh, sharpen one another. It is Christ using the body of Christ to sanctify us in Christ. And if we negate this, we fade as Christians. We are ineffective. We become ultimately like the world. But on the other hand, the church does not simply exist to meet the needs of itself. The church is the arm of Christ to reach the nations. Christ has said, go into all the nations and I'll be with you. He came to bring peace to the world as we would go through and preach the gospel to a world that desperately needs it. And now the church here, in the first seven chapters, was commanded, I want you to go from Jerusalem to Samaria to Judea to the utter ends of the world. But where's the church at the moment? They're in Jerusalem. They're doing a good job. They're strengthening. They're reaching Jerusalem, but they're not reaching the nations. They've got one, they're they're sort of a little bit offhand in one sense, a a bit too weighted. They're growing in grace, they're impacting Jerusalem. But then we see this divine tension that comes here where they are now called by God and scattered to go and reach the nations. So we are not given as a church to simply focus on missions. If we just focus on missions, we become, we ultimately will be given a a man-centered gospel. It'll be all about pragmatism. It'll be all about how do we reach the nations. But nor should we negate the need to bed down in the graces of our Lord Jesus Christ. The stronger and deeper we are, the more effective and wider we can go. And this is what we have here. God's teaching them, you go deep that you can go wide. And we need to hold these two tensions together. The shrewdest trick of Satan is to get us better down in one or the other, but it's not a either or, it's a both and. And so God here, how does he use persecution? He uses persecution to bring them to those both aspects of the tension that we have in the church. Send out, dig deep. Also, Persecution repositions the church. It repositioned the church. I'll tell you a little story that somewhat embarrassing, but when I was young, um, I was playing with matches in a local bushland. And just so happens the matches were in the box, and before I knew it, there was a fire on the ground. And here I was, really worried, and I was thinking, well, there's no water around, and I start smashing it with some wood. That didn't help it. Right, and the, the, the embers are just going like this, just going out, and then it was okay. I mean, it's got it out, but, um, but no one got hurt, okay? Um, why do I give you that story? Because this is really what happened to, the pers- happened to the church when it got persecuted. The more Paul Saul smashed the church, the more those embers flew 
to ignite in other areas. That's how it works. Just as I was smashing that fire to get it out, the more he smashed it, the more it just went out. It says they were scattered throughout the regions. Where, where were they meant to go? Judea and Samaria to the ends of the earth. Where did they go? They went to the regions of Judea and Samaria, except the apostles. The Greek word for scattered is diaspora, where you get the word diaspora. And diaspora means the sort of Jewish Christians living outside of Palestine. And diaspora, word for scattered, is an agricultural term. So the farmer diasporas the seed. Now, he does it not so much so it just simply goes and dies. He diasporas the seed for the purpose of going and planting where where where, where you're put. You are scattering for the purpose of fruiting. The result would be a crop and then a harvest. And so notice what the great gardener does here. Through the use of persecution, he's literally scattering believers throughout the very regions that he has called them to go. I love what it says in, and you can turn over to Acts eleven nineteen. It says, now those who were scattered, diaspora Because of the persecution that arose over Stephen, travelled as far as Phoenicia and Cyprus and Antioch. And then it goes on to speak of this. What happened in Antioch? This is where the epicentre of Christianity moved from Jerusalem to there. And this is where Paul and Barnabas Barnabas were actually sent out of. And Paul, it's so interesting, that Paul is scattering the church and he will end up being converted and spend a year in Antioch teaching the brothers and sisters about Christ. So he's just scattering to inflame, scattering to grow. And here we see it. They go to the very places that they were called to go earlier on. So when we understand that we live by divine design, that the steps of a righteous man are ordered by the Lord, then we can face with joy, wherever the Lord scatters us. We have to understand that where you are at is the place where God has planted you. My wife, um, Christy, her parents lived in many places around the world in doing missions. And one of the favourite things uh, my mother-in-law would say to Christy is just this statement, would you, um, make sure you bloom where you're planted. Bloom where you're planted. Be effective where God has you. See, what made that fire really go was those embers, when I smashed them, they were alive. They weren't dead. They weren't cold. What made the Christian church so effective, when Saul is smashing it, it's sending live, hot, not cold Christians to pronounce the gospel, to spread the gospel, to spread the good news. And we are called, brothers and sisters, to bloom where God has scattered you right now. Now, maybe, maybe the Lord is wanting to scatter you. And maybe it's not going to be persecution. Maybe it's a prod in your heart. Uh, Maybe you're retired. Well, that's the best time to start getting serious for missions. You've got all the time in the world. No, I'm sure you don't. You're one of the busiest people ever. But we need to bloom where we are planted. We need to be inflamed where we are are scattered to. Be used of the Lord where you are. So what we see here is that persecution becomes a servant of God and not a master over God. The sovereign Lord is doing his work through the free will uh, attacks against the church. God is doing it. God is overseeing. The second main thing is that he uses, God fulfills his mission by mobilizing congregants equipped with the word. Now, you might think, and just from a, from a casual look at Acts, you might think, well, well, I might ask you, who do you think spread the word? What, what, who were the people? You might look and say, well, Peter and Paul, yeah, those names are pretty prominent. You might say the apostles. You might say teachers, evangelists, uh, preachers, pastors. Well, actually, this text tells us it's quite different. 
Notice in verse 1, it says, they are all scattered throughout the regions except the apostles. The congregants are on fire for Christ. The congregants are scattered. They become the ones to preach and teach the word. They become the ones to proclaim the gospel. The apostles stayed in Jerusalem. And what did they do? Well, verse 4 tells us, doesn't it? Now, those who were scattered went about preaching the word. Now, the word preaching here, it probably shouldn't be actually translated preaching because in the Greek it is euangelizo, euangelizo, which actually means good news. You take the verb form of that, or it means gospel. You take the verb form, it's gospeling. They are gospeling the word. Now, it could be said they are gossiping the word. They are everywhere they go. It's like it's on their lips. They stop at a roadside inn. What are they doing? They are gossiping the word. They are gossiping the good news of Christ. Uh, Whatever circumstance, they are telling people about the crucified Jesus. They are telling them how they can be saved. They are telling them the good news. If they're getting their fruit at the market, whatever they're doing, they are sharing, these congregants, the wonderful news of Christ. And how did they know this wonderful news? Like I said, because they had been rooted in Acts chapter 2, verse 42. They had been given themselves to the apostles' teaching. They had devoted themselves to the word and became subservient to it. Every Christian immersed in Scripture and empowered by the Holy Spirit is a powerful combination. Immersed in Scripture, empowered by the Holy Spirit and obediently going out, man, that's a powerful combination. That is the live amber that sets a place on fire. So it wasn't the fact that they were scattered that caused the flames to fly out. It was that they weren't cold. They actually had a zeal for God. They were transformed to the heart. They shared what they knew and what they loved. Scattering was one thing, but the scattering of live, on-fire Christians was the main thing. And we get this example here of Philip. Philip goes out, and he is one of the... Remember, he is the second under Stephen in Acts chapter 6. And it says that he went down to the city of Samaria and proclaimed to them the Christ... Now, we don't really have time right now to talk about Samaria, but Samaria was really uh, made up of outcasts from the Babylonian exile. Some Jews were left there, and uh, they interbred with the pagans around, and then that's where you had the Samaritans, and so they were very much looked down upon. But you can just see right here that the gospel had no problem of uh, crossing cultural, racial boundaries and tensions. The gospel is unstoppable. God chose to use ordinary congregants from Jerusalem to impact the world for Christ, equipped with the word and the Holy Spirit. Wherever they went, they gossiped the gospel. It is, Romans 1.16, the power of God unto salvation. So what do we see? The Lord fulfills his mission by making persecution a servant and not a master, by mobilizing congregants equipped with the word, and then lastly and very briefly, by bearing fruit in unlikely places. The church was ravaged and they then are scattered to all these various places, to Samaria, to Antioch. And they proclaimed the news wherever they went. And we hear in, uh, we see in verse 6 that as Philip preached, it says the crowds with one accord paid attention to what was being said by Philip. So he's proclaiming the gospel, but he's being effective among the people. It says that he drove out evil spirits and he healed people paralyzed or lame. And then in verse 8, we see this beautiful outflow of what it means to receive the good news. For it says in verse 8, so there was much joy in that city. That city that was an outcast city, that city that was dead, destined for hell, became a city, a light of joy. The word that brings persecution brings much 
joy. And the joy that the gospel brings is greater than any trouble it also brings. Christ alone has the power to deliver us from Satan's hold. Christ alone provides the comfort we see in verse 2, where they're lamenting over Stephen's death. That's what persecution brings. It brings pain. It brings uh, distress. But Christ alone has the comfort to give to any who are suffering, trials, persecution, whatever it means. Christ alone has the right to forgive sins. And that is what brings the joy in the human heart and brings joy to the city here in Samaria. The Lord fulfills his mission by making persecution a servant and not a master. The Lord fulfills his mission by sending the congregants out, equipped with the word of God, and by bearing fruit in unlikely places. Beloved, if you love him and trust him, then be sure that suffering and persecution is going to be part of his plan. This is the cut in. But it's not to harm. It's actually for good. It's to grow you in the grace of him and to bring him the most amount of glory. That is the paradox of persecution. That is the paradox of suffering. You'll never grow and probably do very little for God without him having to squeeze you and squeeze me and squeeze the church. Let us be encouraged today as we set our minds on Christ and commit our ways to him and to bloom where we are indeed planted. Let us pray. Our Lord and our mighty God, we pray that you would grow us in the grace and the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. Lord, we even pray that you would not allow one trial or persecution or suffering that is, comes upon us to be fought to the ground and wasted, but you would use every one of them to grow us in Christ, to strip ourselves away, our pride, our self-interest, our self-reliance, to trust exclusively on Jesus and that you would use us personally, use us as a church to not only grow deep, but grow wide as we scatter the gospel out and trust the Lord to grow it where it might be planted. We praise you and thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Have the singers come up and lead us in singing.